1964, Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev proposed that a civilization's level of technological advancement could be measured by the amount of energy it is able to harvest and use. At the first level, Kardashev placed civilizations capable of using all the energy that falls on their planet from its parent star. For us, that means the sun. The Earth only receives 20 millionth of a percent of the energy output by the sun. We're only able to harness a very small portion of that. We need to advance ourselves as a species to be better at energy production and transportation. But why would Kardashev have chosen a civilization's ability to harness energy as the primary measurement of its advancement? Because energy is the means by which humans have transformed the basic state of things, not just an unpleasant state, but a brutally inhospitable one, into a livable environment. Civilization, effectively, you could say, first commenced at the discovery and mastery of fire. But once we discovered fire, we could cook, and we could hunt, and we could store stuff, cook it for later, and not die of salmonella, and civilization took off. And it was this ability to cook which created the energy surplus that allowed us to evolve our large brains. And so human awareness itself sprang from energy, and the ingenuity which came with it has enabled us to create everything that underpins modern life. We harnessed animals, putting their energy to work for us in carrying, milling, and plowing. We figured out basic hydropower and windmills, basic steam, and as we kept advancing in terms of our sources and uses of energy, civilization kept advancing. Today, a single person in the West enjoys the energetic equivalent of 600 humans working for them. Think reliable hospitals, transport systems, easy access to goods and materials, all of it grounded in energy expenditure, making life safer, easier and better. Every single increase in energy efficiency brings with it an advancement in human comfort, productivity, basically moves us up the advancement chain. Thinking about your life today and really thinking about it, obviously food and water are quite important, but just consider for a second what would happen to the world if we were to turn off all the power. You could probably put a big bet that five to six billion people would be dead within a week with the remaining billion dying the week following. There is nothing more critical to civilization than energy. Energy is everything. And this is why money, our main way of storing and transmitting value, is so closely linked to energy. We're gonna see a bank of stone money right there. On the Micronesian island of Yap in the 1700s, inhabitants quarried and carved rye, huge stones to use as money. They're all arranged in a row. In America, the wampum shell belts used as currency by natives and settlers required significant expenditure of energy in collecting clams, drilling them, and then assembling them into belts and pendants. The carved stones and shell belts worked as money because they existed as unforgeable proofs of the time and energy expended in creating them. And they are still remembered in today's language. Clams, for example, remains American slang for cash. 100 million clams. $100 million to Mr. Darwin Mufla. Perhaps clams and stones seem strange things to use as money, but as the Nobel-winning economist Milton Friedman pointed out, the stones of rye are not so different from how gold works today, transferring value from one government to another without ever leaving the vault. Four tons of rock produce one ounce of the most precious metal in the world. Gold. It doesn't do anything. Why is it so valuable? Partly because it's rare, so it's in limited supply. You can't keep making it. The blood, sweat and tears to produce this ounce of gold is the background to one of the most exciting stories ever filmed. The gold here is a store of value. But there is another through line between the stones of rye, wampum and gold bullion. That through line is energy. Gold, historically, has been the way that we transport the fruits of our labor across space and time. 
So humanity would exchange their physical labor, the fruits of their intellectual output, the fruits of their physical output, um, for, for these shiny rocks, effectively for gold. That allowed us to transport value that we created across vast distances of space and time. Gold could do this because of what the cryptographer Nick Zabo calls unforgeable costliness. It takes a huge amount of energy to get this metal out of the earth. Just as with wampum and the stones of rye, this guarantees scarcity and limited supply. Inherently, what gold is, is proof of work. We put in a ton of energy to find the gold deposits, to move tons and tons of rock in order to get grams of gold, and then refine that into condensed proof that all that work was done. That's essentially what gold is. You can carry these things around as money, knowing that the time and energy it takes to make them ensures a degree of scarcity, which preserves their value. Perhaps to foreign settlers, the time and energy expended in creating wampum, and indeed it was a major industry for some native tribes, seemed wasteful and ridiculous. Yet it was energy the Native Americans considered well spent in service of producing reliable money. Money which held its value absent any central authority. Creating money can seem like a waste uh, to people who are not familiar with the needs that money serves. But once you have an established form of money, that actually increases the efficiency of most other economic transactions. What you put in in one area of energy, you basically save often several times over in, in another part of the economy. And that's often the part that's missed when outside observers look at commodity money or other types of money and, and find it to be wasteful or arbitrary. The natives wouldn't waste time making money if people didn't need it. And if people needed it, the effort expended in making it was not wasted. Natives drilling seashells or hewing stone or miners laboring at a rock face. The energy expended is simply and purely proportionate to the value people get from using it. And little is as useful as money, one of the key human tools in supporting civilizational coordination and organization. In 1971, the US dollar broke its formal link with gold, but it was still to remain inextricably linked with energy. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. We must protect the dollar from the attacks of international money speculators. Following this announcement, the US made a deal with Saudi Arabia. The global oil market would be denominated in and conducted with dollars ensuring a constant global demand for the currency. There were two sides to the system. One was simply that the Saudis would agree to price oil sales in dollars, and later that would lead the rest of OPEC to also price the oil in dollars. On the American side, we agreed to protect the Saudis and sell them an inordinate amount of weapons, essentially, and like preserve their role geopolitically in the Middle East. Doesn't this mean a change in the world balance of power between the developing nations like you, the producers, and us, the developed industrialized nations? Yes, it will. You have to adjust yourself to the new circumstances. And I think you have to sit down and talk seriously with us about this new era. That allowed the dollar to retain global relevance and to double down uh, at a time when its, its future was very much in question. So this was hugely helpful for the elites in the US at least. And that was the petrodollar system. But this commitment to protect and police the Persian Gulf created a massive new energy overhead for the US dollar. If you look at the petrodollar fundamentally, it's really backed by the US military. And the US military burns 4.8 billion gallons of fuel a year <laughs> to protect the petrodollar. So there is a massive cost there and there is a massive environmental footprint but you rarely hear anybody talking about that, if at all. So a single stealth fighter jet costs $1 billion, and on an average flight, I believe it will burn around 16,000 gallons of fuel. The United States owns hundreds of these, and they fly all the time on practice missions, on actual missions. An aircraft carrier burns tremendous amounts of energy. But if we think about just the vast 
scale of the petro-industrial war machine and the amount of human life that has cost, the amount of ecological devastation we have seen as a result of Western nation states bombing the shit out of third world countries to maintain their access to cheap oil, it just absolutely pales in comparison. And because it ties the interests of the United States to oil, the petrodollar system may well have functioned to preserve not only the dollar, but also oil production itself, one of the most polluting forms of energy. Would we have evolved away from the oil industry faster, were its interests not entwined with those of the US dollar? We have central bankers going on television saying they are concerned about the ESG footprint of the crypto mining ecosystem when they are flying around the world on private jets and using taxpayer dollars to subsidize a highly developed multi-trillion dollar oil and gas industry in order to maintain the petrodollar status quo. Those two things are ideologically incompatible. And this brings us to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one of the only industries that is extremely transparent about its energy usage, which I think makes it an easy target. What this transparency means is that unlike almost any other industry, we have a pretty good idea of the Bitcoin network's energy use. Our best guess is around 100 to 150 terawatt hours of electricity per year. And this comes from making an informed guess as to the kinds of machines that are active on the Bitcoin network and their energy consumption. This is an estimate that is relatively uncontroversial. The Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is generally considered to be the most credible source on this. And that's the range that they're projecting or looking at. At this point, it's still rounding error 0.1% of global energy usage. And yet, Bitcoin's very transparency means this minuscule slice of energy has received disproportionate media attention. Bitcoin takes enormous amounts of energy to digitally mine. We have warned at the Financial Times now for many months that cryptocurrency is filthy. It costs a lot in terms of energy. Probably a small country is the total usage. It is projected to consume as much energy as all the data centers in the whole world this year. But judging by precedent, using a great deal of energy is in itself not a crime. The cruise ship industry uses 250 terawatt hours a year, more than twice the energy of the Bitcoin network. And as far back as 2016, the online advertising industry was already using around 106 terawatt hours, a huge amount of which was spam. And in Americans' own households, always on devices, use 1,375 terawatt hours a year, 12.1 times that of Bitcoin's consumption expended for the convenience of having a thing respond instantly rather than after a few seconds. Some might say Christmas lights are a terrible use of energy. Christmas lights in the United States alone consume more power than the entirety of the Bitcoin network. Yet we don't have an energy police that's banning the use of Christmas lights because people are willing to, to pay to use electricity in that way. The implication is that the value of the Bitcoin network must be less than luxury cruises, Christmas lights, or a nation of Alexas listening in for our next command. But even if Bitcoin's social value does rival that of Christmas lights, why make miners burn energy to earn Bitcoin? Why should a digital currency have to use up any physical resources at all? For the answer, we need to return to the shell belts of the Native Americans, to gold. A layer of rich ore which produces 8 million ounces of gold a year. And to the carved rice stones of Micronesia. Bitcoin is part of a rich history of currencies that have embedded proof of energy, proof of work done over time, as a strategy to secure their value. Bitcoin actually approximates what money always was in a better way than just about any other type of money that humans have ever found. It's essentially a ledger system combined with this proof of work element. Wampum could only be created by spending time and energy, and that effort was proof of the value it had to its makers. In the same way, Bitcoin is rewarded only when a miner can prove that they have done a certain amount of work. This requires electricity. Embedded in each Bitcoin, like a bar of gold or a string of shells, is proof that this work was done. 
No state or authority has ever instructed or forced anyone to mine Bitcoin. Mining is an activity carried out by individuals in response to the organic emerging demand for Bitcoin. Every day, tens of thousands of people are choosing, and the critical word here is choosing, to join the Bitcoin network, to engage in the Bitcoin economy. And I think that's where the energy use arguments become really spurious and difficult to follow. You know, Bitcoin is not a corporation. There's no top level organization deciding how much energy the Bitcoin network should use. Instead, it's this quilt of millions of decisions by millions of actors in the ecosystem. And so really it's, it's the miners are following what the market's doing in terms of millions of people wanting to use Bitcoin for a variety of different purposes, whether it's storing value, whether it's making payments. And so miners are adapting to that market demand constantly. There are a group of people around the world who have decided that for them, Bitcoin has value. That's subjective, that's not objective. So attempts to qualify or quantify that feeling people have, I think is a fool's errand. Why then criticize Bitcoin's energy use and not that of other currencies? Perhaps, again, because Bitcoin has such a transparent and direct relationship with energy. Gold, shells and carved stones each require several stages of human and mechanical processing to render them as money. Bitcoin mining requires electricity, processors and code. And of those, electricity is more or less the only factor miners can exploit to increase the amount of Bitcoin they earn. The image of thousands of Bitcoin miners wasting energy is far less romantic than that of native women preparing shell belts or miners going west in search of fortune. The gold shines and like that. Struck it, Kurt. Perhaps it's even anti-romantic, but at root it's the same proof of work, scaling up in real time to meet the demands of an emergent market distributed across the entire world and made possible by the internet. What essentially Bitcoin is, is a currency of energy. Work put into the blockchain is the arbiter of truth. Why is gold worth some 20 bucks an ounce? I don't know, because it's scarce. A thousand men say go searching for gold. After six months, one of them's lucky. One out of the thousand. His find represents not only his own labor, but that of 999 others to boot. That's uh, 6,000 months or 500 years, scrabbling over mountains, going hungry and thirsty. Now, it's a gold, mister, is worth what it is because of the human labor that went into the finding and the getting of it. Never thought of it just like that. Well, there's no other explanation, mister. Gold and stuff ain't good for nothing except for making jewelry with gold teeth. <laughs> so what is the consequence of a currency whose production and value is so closely tied to energy? Let's recap. Bitcoin miners need to find low-cost energy to get an edge. And despite state coal subsidies in some countries, this now mostly means efficient, clean energy. Wind, solar, and especially hydro, but also flared natural gas, even geothermal. Because of the way incentives work with miners, they have a direct incentive to find the cheapest energy available. And in a lot of cases, the cheapest energy is renewables. We've been seeing miners for the last decade increasingly shift towards cheaper sources of energy, which have been renewable. The industry is not specifically regulated to emit a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions per Bitcoin mine. They've been shifting towards renewables because it makes economic sense. More than two thirds of the energy produced in the world is waste energy because it's produced during the hours of the day when there's not demand to consume it. And it's also produced in a place where there's not transmission to move it across space and time. And so that energy goes unused and wasted. It is a misnomer that Bitcoin is using all the energy of a country like Switzerland, for example. That may be technically true, but that's not the real story. You have to peel one layer of the onion back and realize that a lot of the energy that the Bitcoin network is consuming is waste energy that otherwise was not available to be consumed. This is why the Bitcoin industry was so excited when the president of El Salvador announced the availability of unexploited thermal energy from one of the country's dormant volcanoes. Here was a cheap, stranded input which could provide an edge in the race to mint new Bitcoin. El Salvador's latent natural energy may soon create a significant percentage of the next decade's supply of new Bitcoin, and Salvadorians themselves stand to benefit. 
specifically of where these volcanoes happen to be and where these hydro plants happen to be and where these wind and solar farms happen to be in various countries, often they're far away from population centers. So what this will allow is electrification of new areas and creating new economic activity. So for El Salvador, you're looking at these communities in the mountains or by the rivers that can get a jump start with economic activity. And once there's like Bitcoin mining, there's other stuff. Oh, those people need food. There might be some housing, new communities. So just like mankind developed along rivers in our history, maybe we'll start to develop more activity around Bitcoin mining. Once an industry begins to grow, there's a whole ecosystem that builds around it. It's not just the miners, it's the skilled workers working around energy systems, electricians. It's the businesses supporting it, whether that's on the manufacturing side or on the skills side. For the Congo, only 9% of the population out of like 90 million people have access to the grid. And that causes an enormous amount of deforestation because they get their energy basically from biofuels by cutting down trees and producing charcoal. It creates also a lot of indoor air pollution, which kills a lot of children. And it's, it's just a disaster all around. So if all of a sudden you had 90% using hydroelectricity instead of biofuels, man, that would be a massive difference maker, both for the environment, both for people, both for, for everybody. And Bitcoin can help us get there. Because Bitcoin miners are always on the hunt for clean, efficient energy, renewables already account for 39% of the Bitcoin network's energy use, a number that's increasing all the time against a general energy mix of just 11% renewable. The cleanest types of energy are also the lowest cost types of energy because it's the most efficient types of energy. If Bitcoin is able to make those types of energy even more cost effective, it should actually help to promote renewable energy development, whether it's clean types of nuclear energy, appropriately placed solar energy, and whether it's hydroelectric energy. By making all those types of energy sources more efficient, it can actually strongly incentivize the growth of renewable energy in a way that some of our prior attempts, our top-down attempts, haven't been able to do very effectively. Cheap power is cheap because it is efficient. It is efficient because there is less waste in turning it into a useful form. And less waste means less carbon less pollution, less negative externalities. Captured today, the ocean caught fire in the Gulf of Mexico, just west of the Yucatan Peninsula. As we have seen, Bitcoin, like shells and gold, uses energy as a means to establish value. But unlike those other monies, Bitcoin's demand for the most efficient power pushes miners to innovate, obtaining power which is either wasted, like trapped methane, stranded, like remote volcanoes, or simply efficient and therefore clean. In contrast with gold, the search for which leads to more dirty, wasteful mines, the search for Bitcoin appears to lead to greener and more efficient energy production. I think volcano mining is very interesting because you have this energy source and it may not make sense to tap it for some use cases, but Bitcoin miners are very mobile. We can move to where the power is. You can set up your mining facility very close to the source of power generation. So it could be on the volcano. That's something that is unique to Bitcoin mining. You know, normally when you generate power, you need to move it somewhere else. You need to move it to the city or to industrial facilities or somewhere. But for mining, we are able to go where that power is. It's a very interesting use case to tap into their natural energy sources and leverage it for Bitcoin mining. Consider that since 1992, the year of the Rio Climate Summit, top-down attempts to transition the world to cleaner energy have fallen astonishingly short of their targets as CO2 levels have continued to rise. These figures show how the carbon credit system these meetings implemented has proved substantially ineffective. Each year, companies are allocated a carbon allowance, which can then be bought and sold via a market. If a company goes over its allowance, it can just buy a bigger allocation, permitting it to continue business as usual. By contrast, Bitcoin has created a market incentive to do exactly what is now almost certainly necessary find and release the vast amounts of clean, efficient energy we need to bring a better life to more people while maintaining a habitable planet. And Bitcoin does this not because it seeks virtue or because it wants access to subsidies, but because the search for cheap power is the search for clean power. But it goes further. As in the case of El Salvador's volcano power, the guaranteed income from Bitcoin mining makes possible the huge capital expenditure required 
to set up new sustainable power plants. It's de-risking construction of renewable energy facilities. It's de-risking it because it is willing to buy 24-7, 365. And when you have a predictable buyer, predictable revenue stream, it's easy to plan out your operations and that certainty means that that site gets built. One thing that you find, especially in emerging markets, but also with new types of energy in developed markets, is that they're building out this proof of concept. They don't necessarily have the electricity infrastructure, the distribution infrastructure to get that energy to where it needs to be. You know, it's a long distance from population centers. And so you have kind of a chicken and the egg problem where you can't really build that electricity production until you have distribution infrastructure, which is very expensive. We also can't build that infrastructure until you are sure that you have some sort of demand in place to make that whole project profitable. And so what we see with Bitcoin miners is that they can help bootstrap new types of energy or established types of energy in new locations, especially developing locations. Something similar is happening in Wyoming, Texas and Alberta, where oil rigs flare off huge quantities of waste methane. Bitcoin miners are moving in to capture this methane with portable mining equipment. Imagine if you wheel it into a oil field that's just flaring the natural gas because they're not collecting it, they're just flaring it into the atmosphere. You can't live in this smell. Well, it's just like an airplane passing through. And the energy that's generated is used to mine Bitcoin. I'm noticing that the oil wells that used to have orange flares at night, you'd be driving and you'd see them in the distance and that was flaring the natural gas, the methane that's coming out from the oil production process, both at plants and also at the wells themselves. And now you start to see that they're gone. And the reason is, in most cases, that Bitcoin miners have cut deals with whoever owns the oil well to capture the flared energy, to turn the turbine, to create the power to run the Bitcoin miner. And you see these little huts that have popped up next to the oil wells. And uh, that's where there's a Bitcoin miner inside. Most folks probably don't even realize that when they look at them. Not only are we taking that natural gas and using it as electricity, we can capture the carbon, okay? You're not venting the carbon dioxide and creating acid rain and CO2. We capture it, we put it underground. Like there's just so many environmental benefits. So in that case, yeah, we are cleaning the environment. All energy that's stranded and wasted now potentially has a home and now it can potentially get rescued. And so portable Bitcoin mines, right? A portable building that can house Bitcoin ASICs and be modular, right? you can move it around relatively easy and you can set it up and, and connect it into any primary energy source, whether it's hydroelectric or solar or wind or natural gas and be able to effectively create a market for that energy uh, right there on the spot, anywhere in the world with an internet connection. That's really Bitcoin's killer app. Flared methane alone could power the Bitcoin network many times over. And by doing so, Bitcoin would become not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative. Look. It's a massive environmental benefit. This is a benefit to air quality all around the world, and it's a serious problem. So Bitcoin should be celebrated. Consider this question. How many other stranded or wasted resources does Bitcoin make it possible to tap? Could Bitcoin be the engine that will release an exponential wave of clean power generation? The wave we need to advance our civilization. What will be the marginal consumer of energy to get to those projects that become economically viable? I think it'll be Bitcoin. So good, good, good. And this is why we can truly call Bitcoin a greening machine, a system with the potential to explode the growth of renewable energy. As we have seen, the energy expended in creating Bitcoin is one of the key ways it establishes its value. But that same energy, the work in proof of work, also secures the Bitcoin network, helping to create a true money of the public outside the control of any one intermediary. No government or billionaire or gang can corrupt or control Bitcoin, and all attempts to do so have so far failed dismally. Bitcoin, the Indian government is quite likely to ban it pretty soon, or at least that is what the government says. Bitcoin is under pressure after Turkey banned using that as payments. Bitcoin will go to zero. China stepping up on its crackdown on Bitcoin mining as the reality of... But what does it matter that Bitcoin has survived all these attacks? What is the point of a money without intermediaries? In short, 
It is a money that can function when those intermediaries become unreliable or corrupt. Okay. Across the world, trust in institutions, from authority figures to governments to media and politicians, Alternative facts. even science and medicine is failing. But even as this decay of trust has become deeper, Western central banks have relied on our faith and credit to print trillions of dollars to support a frail and inequitable system. Just getting word from the Federal Reserve. Bombshell announcement from the Federal Reserve. It is an absolutely historic week, both in terms of the speed of Fed purchases and, of course, the magnitude. How long can they expect to keep our trust? In the grocery store, at the gas pump, on the car lot, prices keep rising. In the U.S., there is virtually no collective memory of times of high inflation because the last time we saw this in America was in the 70s. And so there's not that many people alive today that really deeply remember what it's like. The Labor Department reported Thursday that consumer prices jumped 5% over the past year. That's the highest inflation rate in the U.S. since 2008. You write in a new piece for CNN that inflation has actually surpassed wages and unemployment as the public's top concern about the economy and that the White House can't actually do much about it. So what's the plan? If you look at our fiscal and monetary situation here, we're talking 25 plus percent year over year growth in the money supply. This looks like wartime finance. This was the similar framing that we had after and during World War II, after which we had a period of monetary repression. In America, we've experienced inflation for the past dozen years. Inflation caused by government debt and easy credit policies, which cut the value of our dollar nearly in half. People don't remember what it's like to have inflation, but that kind of looks like what we're headed towards. Wealthy Venezuelan families saw their fortunes disappear, and the poor were pushed even further into desperation. A tragedy is unfolding in Lebanon. Inflation has driven the country's currency to historical lows. An economic crisis that the World Bank says will likely rank among the world's worst of the last 150 years. All the people are hungry. No one has anything to eat. There's no electricity in our homes. Children need milk. No one can afford to buy it. That's why we're here. We often look at things from a privileged perspective, but a lot of people in a lot of different locations don't have access to efficient payment systems, reliable currency. The majority of people still live in authoritarian regimes in one way or another. The ability to have permissionless money that has a fixed supply cap to it is actually pretty useful for a lot of people in the world. People that suffer under authoritarian regimes, they definitely appreciate the merit of a system that allows you to store your life's output, your labor, your capital, and your time in a medium that is not controlled by the state. And that's a very simple case to make. It's one that I have to make to Westerners and Americans that don't appreciate this. It's one that I don't have to make to Argentines, Nigerians, Venezuelans, Colombians, Kenyans, people living in former Soviet Union countries, authoritarian states or countries that are suffering double or triple digit inflation. We're talking billions of people here. We've seen huge corrections in traditional financial systems. Dating back 50 years, it seems like we're on a cadence where every certain number of years, sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 10 years, there's an enormous crash. It started in stocks in the early 70s, then it was commodities with oil, then it was interest rates, and then going to the 1987 stock market crash. The law of gravity hit Wall Street today, and as stock prices plunged even more than they did on Black Tuesday of 1929. And we saw it in real estate. It's just kind of whack-a-mole. What you seem to be saying is that there is a very predictable time bomb effect here. Exactly. The 90s, a bond market correction, then we had the, the Russian default. <laughs> And then we had the internet bubble. This money machine, the internet, the information technology revolution, it's a hell of a mouthful to say. When you're on top of that wave and you're surfing, you got to ride it to the end. That led to the housing bubble, and a lot of it is the responses of central banks to the previous crashes, where they'll just try to smooth things over by expanding their balance sheets and pushing credit into the economy. The Federal Reserve has moved quickly to... Uh 
bring order to the financial markets. There are some concerns about the stability of traditional systems because we've lived it. And what I like about Bitcoin is the systemic stability. It's almost at a Six Sigma quality control level in terms of network uptime. Bitcoin as a piece of software is unbelievably stable. While we look at the traditional financial system where fiat currencies may for now appear more stable. The increases will happen. Then Bitcoin. We're not saying they will reverse. That's not what transitory means. But the underlying systems may not be as stable as Bitcoin. So there will be inflation, but the process of inflation uh, will stop. That's what I think a lot of folks are sensing, and that it, it is a hedge against systemic instability. Bitcoin, crucially, is premised not on trust in legacy institutions, but on math and energy. It has the potential to render obsolete what may be the least environmentally friendly institution of all time, the petrodollar. Bitcoin requires no warplanes to stain it, no Middle East peace wars, no drone fleets, no multi-billion dollar armament deals. Like the internet itself, it just works. A green machine and a to peer protocol for money in the network age. The F-35 will only ever run on jet fuel. It's never going to be clean ever. Whereas Bitcoin plugs into the wall and whatever's on the other side of that plug is what Bitcoin is. And it won't be long, not more than a decade max, where Bitcoin is 100% powered by renewables and waste. This conversation, really the fundamentals of it, is people that think Bitcoin is useful versus people who think Bitcoin is not useful. If you think it's useful and appreciate its use cases, you quickly realize that its energy consumption is nothing. And on the contrary, I worry about the energy consumption being too low. I want to go to sleep knowing that somebody has to overtake the Argentinian grid to manipulate my money. I probably won't be happy until Bitcoin uses as much energy as America. We're still a fair ways away from that, but that's when I'll be truly happy knowing that Bitcoin, like, no one can touch it. Oh, I don't think we have any sound on you. Or is it me? Hi. Ah, we got it. Do we have sound? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Jamie. Hi. Well, that's that's a good start. That's a good start. Hi. I can't hear the other guys. Brecky oh, Long Bitcoin. Can't hear That's you. That's gonna be really boring if it's just you and I talking to each other. Everyone else That's has sound. Normal. <laughs> there we go. I think that did it. Can you hear yeah. me now? There we are. Yeah. So Wonderful. Jamie's drinking a, Jamie's drinking a beer, and we said that you know the, the time just up leading up to this is when you'd be kind of in a normal situation in the bar waiting for the movie to end. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, well, we're still it, this we're still this film. I was always so embarrassed. 
It's it's definitely a weird thing. I'm a, a former filmmaker myself, and and being kind of standing in the in the lobby of the theater and waiting for people to watch it and watching their reactions, it can always be nerve wracking. But uh, you know, we saw last night that the the reaction was over overwhelmingly positive. I think the original video is at over ten thousand views right now. So I'm I'm so excited to see where uh, where this goes as it's as it's such a needed a needed film in the space, um, and the quality is just absolutely incredible. Um, so, you know, um, Brecky, I, before you start, I, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say two things. You know, it's, it's so amazing to watch a movie like this. Jamie, I'm sure knows this, but you know, to be able to watch people's reactions as the film goes on, is just awesome to be able to. So thanks everybody for the comments and two, two things, you know, I just want to say thank you so much to Swan, uh, the, the whole team at Swan, you guys, um, you know, embrace this thing the first instant that uh, Corey saw it and then shared it internally. And you guys are the ones bringing it to the world. And uh, it, you know, without you guys, we wouldn't have done this. And of course, um, this film is, is, is funded by, you know, Bitcoiners. So God bless, right? Um, thanks, thanks to everybody. 100% funded in Bitcoin, isn't that right, Jamie? That's it, yeah, 100%, mostly, mostly, uh, uh, budgeted in Bitcoin, I, I, I managed to persuade. I was looking at it today. I think it was like, like, well, actually, I think it was every every staff member except one uh, accepted payment in Bitcoin. I will admit that I bribed people slightly with a ten percent <laughs> bonus if they if they took their pay in Bitcoin. And also because because numbers started to go up uh, during the production, I pointed out to people that um, people who'd received their payment in Bitcoin had got a tasty bonus. And so that, that <laughs> enabled me to get almost everybody to get paid in Bitcoin. And, um, you know, it looks like it looks like it was a good decision. I mean, uh, you got to huddle, but uh, when, when, when you're imagining whether you're going to have enough money left over to pay people, it adds a little spice to it. You know? uh, but yeah, funded by the Bitcoin community. So it's, you know, it's really uh, heartening to see that everybody um, feels it's a positive representation and might get might help get the job done because this is a piece of fud which is like it's the fud of the undead the undead fud <laughs> we thought it had gone away we thought it had gone away and now it's back for another round um they've got it back up on its feet again and uh you know we're gonna have to i guess we're gonna have to keep going until it becomes an untenable uh argument Definitely, I'm. Uh, I'm planning to put a big sign on my on my front yard in Christmas lights that says "Bitcoin doesn't waste energy" in, in Christmas lights. But uh, you know, to kick this off, uh, just I in do. case. <laughs> yeah, I do exactly. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Um, I was thinking we could start off maybe by kind of just going around a little bit in case people aren't familiar with you guys. Um, you know, Enrique, Jamie, Brad, um, if you could just introduce yourselves a little bit um, and then we'll kind of, I've got some questions for you and we, we can uh, we can toss those around. Enrique, you're a big time producer, my friend. Who, who, who are you? Tell the people about yourself. Well, look, I, I love uh, film and I love technology and I've done a little both, you know, whenever there was no film work, I'd try to do stuff in tech and, and likewise the other way around. Yeah, I started my career working uh, with a Spanish filmmaker, Almodovar, here in Spain, where I am right now. And uh, I moved on from there to produce my own films. And, and uh, then I ran Warner Brothers for a while and distributed, you know, some of the great Warner Brothers films of the 2000s. Um, and I'm a producer today. I, um, I'm, I'm, I've got several films that, that are kind of, you know, working their way into production, hopefully. And another film with Jamie. And um, so, yeah, and, and then, you know, well, uh, it, was, it was a real pre pleasure to, to join this. And I think, you know, I've got to say it was Brad really who got the, 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 the spark of this film going, right? And it's really important to, to, to know that. It started on, on Twitter, no? If I remember correctly, I remember seeing this ha happen on Twitter. Brad, what, how did this, tell us the story. How did this even get started? Uh, well, you know, Jamie and I have been friends for a while, like, must be like eight years ago we met when i was uh i was doing a, a cheesy 80s horror movie called the legend of the sonic forest ranger wait i saw that like I've, a... I've seen that one <laughs> no I, did you I really no, no. i don't it's think good. so it's I like a, a cheesy a b send up you know send up to 80s horror movies so 
Jamie was running this really cool technology company at the time, which was kind of like using crowdsourced, uh, like the, the ethos of what Bitcoiners are all about, which is peer to peer and um, like supporting technology. And so Jamie was running this platform Voto that I was, I saw it and I was like, this is awesome. Like I can just distribute my movie for free and just give it away to people. And if they want to support me, they can. And you can use BitTorrent to, to like uh, get, you know, seed everything and, and release the movie. So that's where we met because he was into file sharing and like the, the file sharing movement and the whole piracy sort of, you know, the show on, on a steal this show and, and stuff like that about piracy and the file sharing movement. So I've been following Jamie for a while. And then um, he's, he's was working on this new project called uh, Schism, which was a YouTube documentary about the epistemic crisis. It's a documentary series about this like epistemic a crisis of like why have we why has trust been eroded in all the institutions that we used to look up to for our information like mainstream news and the money system and and everything it's like nobody feels like they can trust anything anymore so jamie was doing this really high quality production um you know on on youtube about this epistemic crisis and we got talking about bitcoin quite a bit jamie's been into bitcoin for a while i had him on my podcast magic internet money and so there was a foundational sort of like relationship that me and him had about about this. And I, I was just like, when I heard he was wanting to do something on Bitcoin, like, let's just let's go. I, I'm excited to donate some money to this and see if we can get people because he's such a talented filmmaker and ed, like did all the editing, most of the editing, like co-edited or whatever. And he's so talented that I was like, we got to get all the Bitcoiners behind Jamie because Jamie is Jamie's like he's the guy that can one of the people anyway that can bring the Bitcoin message to a mainstream audience because a lot of us Bitcoiners are like, you know, early Bitcoiners are like kind of fringy, you know, like we're kind of like anarchists or libertarians. And that message sometimes turns off the mainstream folks. And there's a lot of like, there's a billion people going to come into Bitcoin over the next few years. And we need more content that speaks to the average person who maybe hasn't taken that journey down the rabbit hole. And people like Jamie are like the perfect ambassadors and like Sherpas to help guide people that come from that mainstream way of thinking down the rabbit hole to get to like how Bitcoin is for everybody, like the message you guys have been championing. So it, uh, just long story to say, when Elon Fudd started, I was like, I, me and, and Lyle Pratt was another one and, and people on Clubhouse, we were having all these rooms. We we're like, we should just fund a documentary. Come on, everybody. There's like a hundred <laughs> 150 people in a love those room one night being like, let's make a documentary to, 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 to shut this flood down. And Jamie was like the first guy I thought of in seemed like, dude, like people want to fund it. Let's do it. And, and Jamie just kind of ran with it. And uh, it's, I'm so proud of it. Like that it turned out like this. It's such a great, such a great film. And again, like awesome for you guys to, to back, like putting the word out, you guys are doing such a great job at Swan of like pushing out great Bitcoin media. Well, you guys, you guys made it uh, very, very easy for us. We're just happy to be a part of it. Uh, Jamie, uh, you're best known for the Steal the Film series. So I have to ask, are people allowed to steal this film? Can they go out and steal this one too? Is that all right? Yeah, this, this is a free film. And uh, yes, yeah, so Steal This Film was a joke, sort of joke title because it was also free to share. So it was, one, it was one of the first films that was made to be shared on bit on on peer to peer on BitTorrent, so there was just a joke. There's a book called "Steal This Book" that I that I stole from the library when I was a teenager, <laughs> uh, and so I thought I'd make a film called "Steal This Film," and um, and yeah, it was it was referring to the fact that you can't steal it if I'm if I'm giving it away, and there was also this movement at the time, Creative Commons, which I thought was this like goody two shoes thing, which was like all these licenses. You know, you can share it if you. If you you know go to church on a Sunday and then you can share it, I was like, no no no, just just steal it. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. And um, you know, it was really like the beginning of the peer to peer. Well, it was sort of the 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 the, the, the early stages of the peer to peer BitTorrent re revolution. Um, and so this one, yeah, I mean now we're in a new era where you got to remember when I made steal this film, it was not normal to offer your film for free. That was abnormal. Um, 
and I used to be a bit that I did that I was like the only filmmaker whose whose film had been seen like six million times who wasn't driving a Bentley around, you know. But of course, <laughs> these days, plenty of people's films have been seen six six million times. Six million probably gets you a two thousand dollar check from YouTube. You know, it's not it's not that exciting. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, you can steal it, you can share it, and and what we have done, which we did with Steal This Film Two was we've made the archive, all the interviews, because lots of stuff, you know, people said great things that you just didn't make it in. P partly probably because I copied what they were saying and pretended it was my ideas. And so I, I, le I left a lot of stuff on the cut cutting room floor. And so if people are interested in a specific interviewee, they can go and check the archive. But also um, that archive is available to filmmakers to use. And, and the only thing I want is that they make their archive available because it drives me crazy that all these films get made and all the footage is just left in some, on some disc somewhere and wasted. So in that sense, it stays true to the idea of peer-to-peer uh, -peer and sharing. Uh, but we're just in a new era now where, you know, put it on any platform you want, people get to it. I don't think it's so important anymore, the nuts and bolts of how it's distributed, you know, bit torrent. You know, what is important is like, you know, uh, I know you guys have had a similar experience. Like, if it gets important again, if YouTube starts to become so censorious that it prevents us from saying things about, for example, this new monetary system, if they consider that uh, uh, to not fall under the freedom of speech on their platform, then we may start need needing these platforms again, right? Like PeerTube, uh, Odyssey etc cetera, etc cetera. but um right now i'm happy to stick it up on youtube and we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> i really um i really love that you put the interviews up um i'm gonna i've gone through a few of them and it's great to to see like the full sources of, of what went into this um but i wanted to ask like because i'm more of a narrative filmmaker in my my past life not a documentary filmmaker so what what goes into something like this in terms of conceptualizing it did you know what was going into it ahead of time did you just say i'm going to go out and get these interviews and we'll go hit the cutting room and see what comes out of it or you know could you tell us about the process well, it's funny. yeah sure so it so normally what i do is I, I basically i start off by right so when i'm making films on on my on my channel schism uh, and, and what I would do with trust is I'll start out by writing something that's almost like an essay. I mean, I call it a script, but it's almost like an essay. It's just an essay that's written with something very important in mind, which is I always say, you can write something down and you think it sounds smart and then try hearing what you sound like when you read that out loud and you sound like a dick. And, <laughs> and so you have to kind of write it, imagining like, uh, how am I going to feel when I read this? How are people going to how are people going to receive this? So you write what's what would otherwise be a very simplistic or plainly worded essay, and then um, and then I kind of start to think about where I could fit people who 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 might say what, and where I could fit them in, and um, but in this case, the, the truth is I just didn't know a lot about this topic. I'm not an expert on energy. I, I suppose I'm I'm interested in Bitcoin. I've been involved in Bitcoin since quite early on, uh, trying to integrate it into the Vodo platform. So I'm quite confident that I have form, but, but not expertise when it compares to some of the commentators. You know, I'm not staking my claim to being like a big Bitcoin expert. But in this case, I knew so little about the energy part that once I started to interview people, I thought, uh, you know what, this approach that I've taken in, the, in the, 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 the sort of skeleton essay is not really right. And I learned so much from talking to people. Um, and, you know, for example, the first person I interviewed was Hasma Cook. Mm -hmm. And he's just so bold. And the things he said, if you go and watch his interview, he's so in it, you know, he's so like, uh, you know, I want Bitcoin to use more energy. And that backed me off totally from the idea of like an, a, being an, a, an apologist, right? Mm -hmm. You just realize... Yeah this is not the route to take. And, and so the strange thing happened, which is that I just started to modulate, to modify what the film was gonna, how it was gonna be structured as I talked to people. And then I started to change the questions I was asking people. So uh, gradually it became a film that they were making, which I suppose is actually pretty un unusual. Um, mm -hmm. If there is a usual for, for documentaries, I don't know. but. It, and so you've wound up with something that's really like I learned along the way. 
and 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 the film got got modified by the expertise because these people really know a lot you know these people who are interviewed like they're they're real uh, you know these are real experts and they also know a lot about things that you wouldn't necessarily think they like i ask them about the petrodollar and each one of them's got a 10 minute riff on the petrodollar you know it's like whoa i don't have a 10 minute riff on the petrodollar do you you know these these are bright people and uh, so yeah so it, in a way you could say it's a film composed by the people who are in it and that um it, i think that's unusual and and and, and i came out cuz i'll admit when I first realized how much energy Bitcoin uses, I took an intake of breath. And it was like, wow, that really seems like a lot. And so that's where I started, you know? And, and by the end, I felt like we've made a film which can justify what Hass says at the end, you know? Like, I'd like it to use more and I won't sleep until it's using all the energy of America. And you feel like, yeah, okay, this now feels like a justifiable statement. Whereas if you said it at the start, or if somebody had said that to me at the start, I said, you're crazy, you know? So, yeah, so that's, does that give you an idea? I mean, uh, there's, also, idea. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, we, we, we were trying desperately to get Lynn to be part of the film. She wouldn't really, we, we had no way to get to her. And it wasn't until, um, you know, we, we connected with you guys in court, you know, one well-placed call and she was on the other side of a camera two days later. Um, and, right. you know, I, test to some of the things that she says the way she says it sorry jamie but you know she nails it right i mean she's an expert and yeah so you and she you made a really it. profound she made a really profound point which is which i as i said to her at the time it, i you know if you if i if i'd interviewed her at the start it would have we'd have had a section on that which is that uh a sound money uh it, although it although there's an expenditure of energy in creating it, it saves energy through the efficiencies, efficiencies it creates. So right. if you don't have a good money, the amount of faffing around you do, trying to figure out someone to exchange, oh, I need to exchange an ox for 50 bushels of wheat, and you have to try and make that trade happen, and the mm. amount of moving you do, and the amount of oxes that die while you're trying to do it, and so on and so on, it equals a massive expenditure of energy, which money good money makes uh, it, it, uh, make uh, obviates the need for that expenditure of energy and that is a profound point that i would have created a whole section for that because you know i think it's great and so it was sad that we got to her at the end and she only she only like uh, served that that uh, piece of info that nugget at the, the last minute but hey ho you know what's uh, amazing is you, you know you were saying that it kind of came about in a non in an irregular way, you know, it, it, this isn't necessarily the usual way that documentaries are made, but I, I think it was actually perfect because, you know, for someone watching this who might have the same sort of misconceptions that you had, Jamie, you know, you took them on that journey. Um, you know, when you actually said it, I was going to say it too, that like, had you put the, the, the Hasma Cook uh, clip at the very beginning of the, of the film, you probably would have lost people. They would have stopped watching. Like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> but you build and you build and you get to that point where, you know what, you might just be right. So I think that was... Happy accident. Happy accidents happen all the time in filmmaking, and this was a very happy accident. The way it all came. Yeah, about. I think it was good that you oh, were I did skeptic. It as a, I did it this. as a dare. I did it. I did it as a dare to myself. I, I just thought, have if I can make that clip work at the end, if I can make it feel like a feel-good moment, then I know we've done it because that because that's because that means you've built this ladder that you reach the point emotionally where you say, yes, this is a reasonable statement. Whereas at the start, you just said, screw you, I'm, I'm turning this off, this is ridiculous. So that, yeah, it's not, a, it's, not an, it's not an accident, it was like a dare to myself. The real test, I think, comes now. For everyone who's watching, you're gonna go out, you're gonna share this film with all of your friends and family who might not, might not be down the rabbit hole like we are, and then we're gonna see if it really hits home, and I think it will. Um, Ricky, I have a question for you, my man. So this film was entirely funded with Bitcoin um, and productions always face challenges. What were some of the challenges that went into this film? You know, we, this was made during this whole pandemic thing. Um, it was funded with Bitcoin, which turned out, I guess, to be a windfall. I'd love to hear about some of the production uh, from the production side and, you know, what was, what was good, what was bad, what did you not expect? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the most important thing was trying to get the voices, right? So you know, it's your actors, your talent. How are we going to get these people? And of course, normally you'd want to go and see them and spend time with them and, and, and not just have to interview them across 
uh, you know, you know, across the distance. Jamie actually had a, a really interesting idea of sending them uh, kits, camera kits that they could uh, use to, to, you know, try to get the quality up. We, you know, you're, what we're trying to do here is, is, is a film that people think is, is, a, is a dignified film. It's got gravitas to it. And you know, we, we were doing it on a limited budget because obviously the you know the the, the numbers were were not huge by any means. Um, but you know, the other part of this thing was just the vast amount of work that Jamie did just trying to find all of that footage. Um, it, it, it's to me, I don't you know, I don't know how he has the patience because it really is finding little, you know, needles in haystacks, uh, trying to put all that together. I'd say COVID, you know, it, it didn't it didn't help, but when we, it was, the situation was what it was, I'd say probably, Jamie, maybe you'd agree, this got kicked off by Brad and, and the rest of the team that put the money together. And the whole thing was, we need to get in front of this because of the Elon Fudd stuff was front and center, right? So what's going to happen if, um, if this film comes out when this whole thing is either not relevant or not important? And, you know, maybe it's good or bad, I don't know, but the, but the FUD continues, right? I'm, I'm really hoping that this film is going to find itself it's, it's going to find its way to you know some staffers in Washington who who really care to learn and 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 talk to their senators and congressmen about you know, about this so that they can have a more meditated view of what this all means. Um, so you know I I I'd say challenge is not that many. I I would probably say that for for the next film that we're going to do together, the one thing I'd like to do and and Jamie didn't mention that this is the first movie that I've been involved with where the budget actually grew as we were. Um, as we were making the movie, and um, what, yeah. I'd like to be able to, what I'd like to be able to do, in the, yeah, <laughs> what I'd like to be able to do in the next film actually is to, um, and, and this could be for anybody who's out, who's a filmmaker out there, who's thinking, huh, could I maybe, you know, make a movie with Bitcoin? How how would that work? What I'm thinking we, we ought to do is, uh, people are accustomed to earning money in fiat, right? So if, if we um, basically uh, offer anybody who participates in the film that they will be paid their fiat rates, right? And then it'll be up to us to, at every point in time when a payment is made, we'll decide whether the person should be paid in fiat or in Bitcoin. If they want to turn the fiat equivalent into Bitcoin, they can do it right then. But the whole point of that is that if, if Bitcoin is rising, our costs in fiat terms are going to keep going down. And alternatively, if, if Bitcoin is, is, is falling, then we can opt to pay the budget in Bitcoin. Will never be, um, will never be short in Bitcoin terms, because uh, it'll be our option to pay, right? So we would lock a rate basically, and I think that's that's an interesting, uh, you know, kind of maybe formula for the future that helps money grow uh, as you make the production happen. Uh, it's kind of never been a part of anything like that. Usually, just you just watch your your budget go down until it goes to zero. Here, uh, you know, I think that beer that Jamie was drinking, he bought with some of the budget that was left over, right? <laughs> and Brad's budget clearly increased in the past minute. Uh, much better lighting. Look good, Brad. Uh, so, Ricky, what is your Bitcoin story? Uh, how long uh, yeah. have you been into Bitcoin? And, and uh, has this um, movie changed your mind about Bitcoin's energy use? I, I, I'm proud to say that I did I did get started really early. I, I, I was here in Spain and I was trying to buy some in 2013. And the only way I could do it was through local Bitcoins. And that wasn't so easy to do because there wasn't a local local Bitcoins here that at the time that I was aware of. And it involved, uh, you know, sending money in, in postal money orders that you have to buy uh, in the US, but I was here. so. You know, I kind of have to organize myself, but I did begin, you know, the journey uh, back then, um, and I haven't stopped. And and I, um, if anything else, I I, I think um, my whole thing was, I really wanted to be able to give something back because I'm I'm a total lurker. Like if if you look at my Twitter, and please everybody, you know, join my Twitter, but I don't tweet, right? I mean, I it's but I'm on Twitter all day long, and 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 I'm a complete lurker, and I kept feeling like. Uh, I ought to give something back, and uh, and uh, so you know, for me, it was such a pleasure to be able to do that in in this way, and um, and I do think that there is. I think you guys have said it in, in in some of your clubhouses. People talk about it all the time. You need to, if you're going to be part of this whole community, you do need to give something back, right? You've got to have something that people value, that they are willing to 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 pay you in in Bitcoin. I mean, how whatever you do that's valuable. Somebody has to part with their Bitcoin in order to 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 compensate you. 
So, you know, everybody, it's not just about hodling and, and God knows, you know, if you hodl, you're doing your part, but if you can go a step beyond that, there's so much more to do. This is, this is like you guys say, it's so early. It matters to, to, uh, to be active. And I, for a while there, I felt like, ah, you know, who am I to be active here? But, um, you know, here I am with you guys. I never thought I'd be on one of these things. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, by the it, way, I just like Ricky. Rick, okay. Ricky was part. Ricky was the w working on the script with me right at the start. So he he's being he's being characteristically modest. But he was one of the first people to work on what we then thought would be the ending. So and I and I can back Ricky up. He's a, he's super super into Bitcoin. We spent a lot lot of time talking about Bitcoin. Oh yeah. <laughs> To my wife's dismay, I'll talk about it all day long. <laughs> Sounds familiar. I want to make actually. I want to make a movie. I was thinking about. I should, I'd like to make a movie where I, you know, we take Nick Carter and maybe we make a uh, a remake of Risky Business, and he plays the uh, Tom Cruise role. <laughs> <laughs> I love guy. that. Was, <laughs> uh, you know, Bitcoin scam going. I don't know. Is that in the the Warner Brothers library? If so, maybe we can exactly. make it happen. <laughs> Paramount. Well, wait, wait. Yeah. Harry Potter is Warner Brothers, right? So we could just change the galleons for Bitcoin. We'll there you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a it's a great point you make about you know getting involved, and and I think a lot of people can real eventually come to that realization that you know you don't have to work on Bitcoin Core to contribute to Bitcoin. You know, there's lots of ways to get involved in your everyday life, and if you're a filmmaker, all the filmmakers out there, hit us up. Let's make some movies. Um, Speaking of movies, I think we should talk about your next one, which I'm incredibly excited about. Um, and I've got the trailer queued up, so I think what I'll do is I'll play that, and then we can kind of get into the genesis of that and what, what it's all about and how, and how people can contribute. So let's do this. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. All right, one second, three, two, one. Uh-oh. <laughs> we're buffering. buffering. Sorry. Buffering. <laughs> we're going to start that over. It's Vimeo. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Vimeo. All right, we're going to reload. <laughs> Vimeo. In a world where faces are on dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> he, he winks in a minute. Hold on, let me, let me, let me go to uh, Vimeo itself. Give me just one second, folks. Sorry about that. It's all right. In the there meantime... There is a version on YouTube as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe check that, Brecky, on the Schism channel, I presume. I think this no, is going to work. it's not live. It... Okay, go ahead. Nope. Vimeo! I thought Vimeo was supposed to be better playback. You know, it's something, it's, it's weird to, not, it's not related, kind of related, but Schism is such a, like, good, high quality production value, the same as the, uh, the, the film, This Machine Greens. It's really well edited, the music is great, it's high quality. But for some reason, it's being censored from search results. Like when you go try to search the title of any of the Schism films, you don't get them. Like you got to actually go. I find know, no. Direct. It's they, weird. They like, hate it's it. It's so weird. Like it they does hate not it. Rank. Yeah, they but hate it because they can't work out what, what the politics of it are. <laughs> I think I think it was just like I think it was just flagged at the beginning because you had some Trump stuff where you're and it's not even like taking a pro Trump or an anti Trump stance. It's it's just exploring trust and and the epistemic crisis that's happening. And for some reason, it's just been flagged and like you can't even find this on YouTube. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Brecky, so I'm you sending you the link for the YouTube on uh, on 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 Twitter because I can't use the chat here because I'm on my phone. Uh, perfect. In the meantime, you'll, uh, you'll see my hand like lurking around. <laughs> no worries, I'll, I'll grab it right now and we'll put but, it. Up. But you can ask me about. I mean, basically, look the the, the last the last six minutes of this film, uh, this machine greens are pretty much 
on message for, for what trust is about. So essentially, what we're asking is, as Brad was saying, why have all these institutions failed? And why are we in this crisis where no one trusts anything a, the man has to tell them? It doesn't matter whether it's the media, whether it's government, whether it's Anthony Fauci. Tr try telling people what, they, what you want them to do and they'll, they'll say, I don't trust you and I'm not interested in what you've got to say. And, and it, it occurred to me that this is a moment at which Bitcoin gains a new relevance because it's, it's a monetary system that works even if no one... It works in a context in which no one trusts anyone and no one trusts any institution. And, you know, because quite reasonably, 10 years ago, most people might have looked at, you know, the government, looked at the financial system and said, well, I'm generally happy, you know, I'm generally happy with it, it works for me. And I don't think, all, and, and things have changed so much in that decade since Satoshi came up with, with Bitcoin. It, it's almost like he saw it coming Oh, they saw it coming. I mean, they saw that first financial system, the, the first buckles in the system. But um, now we're in a moment where I feel like ordinary people, if you propose to them the idea, do you agree, yes or no, that there's a massive crisis of faith in institutions, there's a massive crisis of faith across authorities, across governments, across, they will agree with that as a proposition. And then when you look around for institutions, for entities that might survive that crisis, what's the first thing you see? Bitcoin. Bitcoin is this entity which, don't, you know, it's like Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger don't care if you believe in it or don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care if, if, if people are trying to ban it. It doesn't care if, you know, if one of the Bitcoin developers tomorrow turns out to be hopelessly corrupt, there'll be a dip and then it'll carry on. And, and nothing else is like that. And, that. and so this film is about, so why did we reach this crisis of trust? That's part of it. I don't think you can answer it completely, but I think you can look at some of the detail. What, what is the relevance and what is the relevance Bitcoin has as a model in this new world, right? So it's not just saying, oh, this is sound money we can cling on to, although that's part of it. It's, how, it's the life raft, right? You're, suddenly this is gonna get a new relevance to you when all these institutions, that's part of it. But it's also like this peer-to-peer -peer question. What do peer-to-peer -peer institutions look like? And it, you know, it's a little like you could, you could have made a much, more boring, a much more boring version of this about Linux, right? Where you could have said, Linux is an operating system created by distributed individuals working in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion on a, on a non, in a sort of non-traditional monetary, monetary uh, system, you know, the, a lot of people contributing for free, a lot of people contri contributing to the public good, that has become the most used operating system in the world, the most secure system, the, the, the only system that's considered prime time by, you know, corporations, banks, and so on, it's, it's the, you know, the best, and it's been done in a peer-to-peer -peer model outside of either the systems of traditional corporations or the state. And so, you know, you know, you could, people are not that excited by Linux. They should be, you know, I always say it's like, it's bigger than the pyramids, you know, it's like this huge thing. And, and, and it seems to me that Bitcoin is a similar thing. You look at it and you say, here is this thing that can survive and prosper in this new environment we're going into, but which is also a model. I mean, you could put it this way. If we can get money done in a distributed fashion, with no no authorities, no uh, no intermediaries, no one you have to trust. What else can we do, right? What, what can't we do? And exactly. that so for a libertarian, right? That's extremely exciting, and that's what I want to make a film about. And so, and then the other component to this is is th this question of trust, because if you trace Bitcoin back, as I'm sure all you guys know, but you trace it back, right? You realize that this system is not. Like a lot of normies, another way they report it in the in the media is like as if we just invented this like last week. Okay, it was ten years ago, but still they say it was just invented, invented out of whole cloth, which is completely untrue. It's a bricolage of systems that re it's a really odd resonance because they were designed 
initially like cryptography designed for spies in the Cold War when, or in World War II, no one trusts anyone. And then you go into the Cold War and it's this information war where it's about keeping your secrets and breaking other people's secrets. And it's like out of this trustless environment, you get this system that can survive where there's no trust. And it starts to piece itself together, right, across the years and arrives at now when no one trusts anyone, no one trusts institutions. We have no clue what we're going to do. You can see it with, okay, I'm going to annoy a lot of people, but you can see it with COVID, right? Whichever side you're on, it's a total disaster, right? It's a total disaster. Um, you can see it with, you know, uh, the, across every institution, governmentality, money, and so on, so on. And no one's got a proposition for how do we survive that. Bitcoin is the proposition. Bitcoin says we can do it. We can do it better than the systems that came before. And the structures that we're using have this lineage, this kind of, uh, this, yeah, this, this, this history that stretches back to this period of design when you were, desi you know, you were designing for a trust no one environment. And, and I find yeah. all of that absolutely fascinating. So it's a film that kind of weaves those things together. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. The only thing I'd say, and it's true, uh, Jamie, is that this thing that you've just said is, is for everybody here on this stream, it's probably pretty easy to comprehend. Nobody's kind of shaking their hands going, I don't understand. Right. If we, if we are genuinely talking about the next billion people who join this thing, there's a lot of work for them to understand. Nobody understands why money's even broken. They don't think money's broken. They just can't make ends meet at the end of the month, much less yeah. uh, do they have a genuine understanding of how broken the trust is with the institutions that are supposed to protect them. And it's a, it's a process, right? So I, I think films like Trust and all the stuff you guys do the in general all the stuff that still needs to be done by so many others we have to we have to remember that the next people we address have to be handheld into an understanding of wh what has gone wrong uh because it's scary right it's really scary um yeah for, it is scary people. but it's also yeah it's, it's what you say like this it's like it's like, what's the on-ramp? And to me, this, this, this thing about what, what Brad's calling epistemic crisis, you know, a, a crisis of like, how do we make sense of what's going on around us? Um, how do we choose what to believe in? How do we construct our idea about what is, what is the right way to live and so on and so on? When, when the institutions that used to construct those things for us no longer function. And, and I think that that's a problem that, everybody can understand and everyone feels emotionally in a way that if you tell them like oh you know uh, bitcoin could be better money or um you know you get a bit closer if you say bitcoin can protect your savings i think that's that's closer um but for many people it's extremely academic because a lot of people are like well i don't have any savings i have a job and i and i and my money goes out and i just about managed to pay my rent and so for me it's all academic but it's not academic if you say this is the beginning of a new way of, of the way we're going to survive uh, this crisis that everybody knows we're in. And at least that's my view. I think you can tell ordinary people and they're not bored by it <laughs> as a proposition. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. If you're saying it's a solution to that crisis, then then I'm on board with that. And that's that's why I think it's like it's like an on ramp that's like. It's 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 an on ramp. You wouldn't immediately you, you you'll watch trust and not know you're immediately being onboarded to Bitcoin. I don't mean that in a sneaky way, but I mean like it it won't it won't immediately start whacking you around the head with like here's how great Bitcoin is and Lightning Network and and here's the new bells and whistles and here's ten people who now accept Bitcoin. It's a film that's much more like systemic. It's much more like here are the conditions in which we all know we live. And here yeah. are some building blocks that we can have, we can, that can get us out of it, you know, that can show us the way forward. I mean, that's I, kind I, of how, go for it, Red. I was just going to say, like, when I first was learning about money back 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever, I was kind of led down a, 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 rob, a rabbit hole that was a little bit disingenuous. And it, it led me to Bitcoin, but I'm still rewriting my 
my things I learned when I went down the, the rabbit hole of which, which was like, you know, eventually led me to nonsense, like, uh, david ike stuff and like you know what i mean it's like they're all trying to control you with taxes and taxes are evil and like stuff that like maybe there's yeah. some truth to that but there there's an epistemic crisis on on the fringe too of people that are trying to find out what's real about money and how money is is a big ponzi scam i think that the, what what got me excited about like backing this project and get, gets me excited about schism and, and, and trust and stuff is that like jamie comes at this stuff from a really a really like friendly good like um it's a it's a good like uh, like if you're thinking about this from a game designer or an app designer or something you want to have a really high conversion ratio to someone who starts at the rabbit hole and goes all the way down and doesn't get turned off and if you if like when i was first learning about money and stuff i think it was like mike maloney films and things like that where so, it was really appealing and really good but some of it was actually not true and like, I ended up thinking that like, well, there's this big gigantic scam and taxes are a big scam. And like hundred percent of the tax, you know, like it's, it's a little bit debatable because if you want a billion people to start like go down, going down the rabbit hole, I feel like there's things that like you can, you can increase the conversion rate of people that come to the truth about money by not taking them so far down a fringe path. And, and by taking them down a path of like something like how Jamie comes from a really unbiased perspective and a really neutral perspective. And it's all about just observing the truth that everybody feels. It's like a really good stand-up comedian, like a really good stand-up comedian does a bit that everybody just gets and everybody can relate with. And that's what I find like with the trust film and with Jamie's other stuff, you can just like the average normal mainstream, you know, normie or whatever can, can relate with, the the narrative that jamie's constructed so i don't know I, i'm grateful for like mike maloney and those folks that that ended up teaching me about <laughs> 10 years ago but like i think i feel like this is this has the potential to be what brings the generation like that's coming up now like gen z's and stuff if they can find this stuff and they're they're not yet deeply knowledgeable about the scheme that like taxes and fiat money is a series like this could actually do a lot of uh, a lot of good to like shepherd people into the into the like the truth about money and and the system in general. The thing is also, you know, it's I think it's partially about this is going to sound I don't know how it's going to sound, but it's it's about entertainment, right? You know, propaganda has taken on a, a has a very dirty connotation, but almost everything you watch is propaganda. Propaganda like Bitcoin is just a tool and you know, if you look at like an old Soviet propaganda film, it, it like beats you over the head with the propaganda, so it doesn't work very well. But, you know, you ever go see a movie that's about, that involves the American military, a movie about World War II, that's American propaganda. It's just highly entertaining, and so you may not realize it. Um, and so if we can create content that, um, you know, I think, was it Ricky, maybe you said the word sneaky before. I don't think it's sneaky. I think it's just intelligent. You know, it's meeting people Ricky. where they want, want to be. And... Hmm. I, Nick Carter I, I is it, the remake of, uh, of Risky Business. We need a, somebody to do a poster. Or send it to me. <laughs> I coined a term for this today on Twitter because I was so pumped by the content, but by the quality of what Jamie ended up with with this film that I'm like, I tweeted out, and I do mean this. Like, if anybody's watching this video or in the chat or wants to share with someone, if you know anybody that's working on anything that's in the same vein of what of what this uh, this machine greens is like for whatever niche like if you're making content for a specific niche or whatever i i will fund it i will try to fund it i will so like come at me with with it's called i, I coined the term peer-to-peer -peer propaganda let's do it let's get the peer-to-peer -peer yeah. propaganda going, i love guys. that got these Bitcoin <laughs> it, resources. Hey, it, it really worked with steal this film by the way you know steal this film i mean partly it's because it was a film about film but it, i must have shown that film in like I don't know, I personally went to a hundred film festivals with that. And I have spoken to so many senior film people. You know, I remember the first panel I ever got invited to was like me and the head of Lionsgate. And I thought that was that was normal. It's not normal for a, for a filmmaker. You can completely make a film and move the needle of, if you make the right film, you can move the needle of how people think about a specific topic and get them to think differently about it. And by the way, Brad, we were just because just we were talking about this uh, earlier, me and Ricky, you know, when I made Steal This Film, like I used to write e academic essays and uh, 
you know, a few people like my essays, but it would be like, you know, you probably get 400, 400 re readers, that, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then I made Steal this film. And, you know, the first week it was like 1.5 million people, whatever. And you realize like, uh, you know, people love watching films. And, and so the fact that you know you've got this medium that people love watching these things, they're really enjoyable, they're emotional, fun experiences. And so in a way, I think you have a, a rubric to make something that people will enjoy and which is accessible to everyone and sort of meets them where they, they, they come to the film. And that's, so that's why I try to, you know, I deliberately eliminate jargon and, uh, and, 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 and also phrases that I think are gonna exclude people. I try to find ways to say it that are gonna be like, uh, less uh, make people less likely to have knee-jerk responses to things so it's it's quite strategic i, I myself think i'm ex extremely opinionated person actually I, I think it's hilarious that you call me neutral i think there's i mean i think that's really funny but i, I try to make the films approachable and that's probably why it comes over like that because you know actually i'm an i'm a pretty extreme i suppose anarchist libertarian uh, you know, and my excitement about Bitcoin is very explicit excitement because I think we've built a system that's probably better than the systems that came before it, and it has no bosses. And I think that's incredible. That you know, that to me is like it's as, as exciting as it gets. And so, yeah, and so that you know, I I think that's opinionated. <laughs> you know, I think that's ideological, but. Um, but um, I think we're going to reach a moment where a lot of people will start to agree that, that that's exciting to them as well. Let's let's have a look at the trailer. If you have you queued it up, okay, Brecky? Yep, it is ready to Give go. Let's see it. One second, we're going to full screen it. Please work. <laughs> Trust. You like the book being asked for that? The sense that nothing is real or nothing is true? Okay. A crisis of trust in touching everything and everyone is true. I'm trying to die. Governments. A crisis of trust in touching everything. A media. News. Science and medicine. <laughs> And since 2008, this lack of trust has spread deep into one of our most basic systems, money. This is a film about trust. And what happens when it is gone? If reports showed the free world to be under actual attack, the go code would be issued by presidential authorization. But it also asks a question. What if a technology developed during the Cold War for a world facing weapons so powerful as to render trust impossible? What if this technology was now ready to take center stage in a world after trust? The magic of Bitcoin is that engineering is arriving to economics for the first time in human history. And it's crypto resistant to corruption. It's the best anti-corrupt system we could come up with in the history of the world. And I think that's a really important idea. That's good, yeah. And, th and this is gonna be a feature film. Um, and and we do aspire the budget will be larger hopefully and, and and we do we do want to see how we can get that film uh platformed in 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 you know whether it's the big you know the big uh netflixes of the world amazons uh guys like that because we we need you know we need that kind of uh of an audience next right and that that's what we're hoping for that last uh shot where you know it's like the matrix of the uh the genesis block yeah. was was fire i really enjoyed that i'm gonna watch that for a, a few times i think today <laughs> great yeah, it took us three story. it took us three months so so get as much enjoyment out of it as you can. <laughs> that's what i was thinking i was like i don't know that probably took a little while proof of work want, right there i want that block as a uh, as a screensaver on my computer um before we move on though 
we can donate to this film. We can get it supported. We can get it funded right now. How many people do we have in the chat who want to donate to this film? I'm going to send some gotta, sets right now. Yeah. All you got to do is go to TallyCoin. It's one of the top uh, uh, top deals up on, on the page. Can we get to it from trust.film? And there's, uh, there's, yes. perks. there's, there's perks as well. If you, if you follow along to the end, you can find yeah. it. There's a list of perks. I haven't put them on the tally coin because it's a little bit like a continuous stream of text. But at the end, there's if you want perks, there's perks. If you if you do want perks, like make an account on 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 tally coin and like just leave a handle so no one can claim your perk. Uh, uh, and then if you go go to trust.film slash crowdfunding as well, that's another way to get to it. Yeah, yeah. See the perks. Uh, it's also, we put it, it, the link in the description to this video so you can click on it right now and send some sats right now and we can raise the entire budget right now. Just go. <laughs> you know, the, 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 this Ethereum film, they raised $3 million by selling NFTs. I mean, what, what do you need $3 million to make a film about Ethereum for? <laughs> we, 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 we need four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to make the best Bitcoin film. Let's do it. <laughs> Three million dollars. I'm excited for this. Um, questions for you about uh, about this machine greens. What? Uh, so what's next? Are we gonna? Are you gonna submit it to every environmental uh, film festival in existence and and uh, cause a ruckus? Or we got a nod and a no. <laughs> oh, some. I, I was only thinking. I found out once the steal this film was being played by the green, the green party at their at their annual summit or whatever they call it. So I, they may well play it. I, I don't know, but I, I'm not. I wasn't thinking about submitting it to places. I was thinking about putting it on YouTube and you know let let people watch it and share it. I didn't think about this as a festival film, uh, but maybe I don't know. There may be there may be festivals for sure and. Uh... You know, I, I've heard already about, you know, college viewing parties that are taking place already. I, I was told about that yesterday. Um, somebody had an amazing thing on, on your chat yesterday uh, suggesting that uh, that they were going to um, quit their job and, and use this to start teaching people things, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the good thing is that I was saying to Jamie, one of the really good things is sometimes we sound really stupid saying what we think we know, but we just can't quite communicate. And so we use things like this film as a crutch to uh, use everybody else's wisdom to make us look a little bit better and smarter and then to get our points across. And I think that can happen all over the place. And, and, and so I think this film will have a, a long life uh, and it's gotta be free. It's gotta be available everywhere for it to do its job. Yeah, and the main thing is instead of thinking about our festivals as a way of distributing the film, whoever asked that question because I can't see the chat is like you should you should share it. That that's the really cool thing about YouTube because YouTube's got a lot of problems, <laughs> uh, but but one of the really cool things is extremely accessible. Everyone knows how to use it, and all you've got to do is send a link, and they pay for it. They pay for people to watch it. You know, they pay the bandwidth, and uh, you know, for all the shit we take from them best to you best to use it uh, so you should share it and share it with 10 people and that you know if those 10 people share it that'd be better than any festival anyway yep definitely i'm just thinking it'd be fun to kind of ruffle some uh, some feathers of of diehard uh, environmentalists who think they know how to save the environment but really they need to learn about bitcoin but you know what hopefully they will uh, they will see it too so also nuclear power because that was the background i just didn't put it in the film but almost everybody of the people who are energy experts in the film mentioned nuclear as the really the only way out of the, of the problem we're in like if you believe there's a problem to the extent that you believe that there's a problem uh nuclear is seems to be across everybody and there were fairly there was you know different stripes of of of, of um attitude to the environmental crisis or uh, you know obviously adam is very different to uh, caitlin is you know but i think almost everybody agreed that nuclear was the way forward and so you know learn about bitcoin and, and we need nuclear power like stat <laughs> uh, and it's really interesting because one of the interviews mags um mentioned she has a friend who's a bitcoin whale and he's funding nuclear fusion research so I think that there's really an interesting intersection between 
the future of Bitcoin and the future of, of nuclear. Because in the end, if you can get that nuclear fusion going, you can mine some cheap Bitcoin. <laughs> Sounds like a sequel to uh, this Machine Greens. Could be. I would Could say, be, yeah. One, one thing that we were talking about, uh, me and Jamie were talking about this the other day, or it was yesterday, maybe even today, it was uh, I think it would be a good idea to take this, um, take this film and, and cut it up to like separate out like one one and a half minute segments to to use for marketing or just educational material on Twitter and, and YouTube and Instagram that then leads people to the the, the, the longer film because like you know Gen Z and millennials and stuff and really anybody that that has been using social media and has got such a short attention span that yep. there's so many good hard hitting well edited great like, uh, like sorry Brad what were you saying pieces. Oh, I wasn't, I I wasn't paying attention. I was. Uh, I got distracted by it. <laughs> yeah, if anybody's on the chat who wants to do, who's interested in doing that, because yeah, I'm burned out. I can't, out. I can't. I can't. I can't do any more editing. But I will give you the rushes and the archive and everything, and and uh, help you if you want to edit uh, sort of bite-sized chunks out of it. That would be great. I, I appreciate the help. Yeah, we can get yeah, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin if we remix this. Yeah, yeah. I get big yeah. Writers to remix it because I was like, man, I'll do it. Like Jamie, you put in so much work, I'll do it. And then I was thinking, like, do I actually have the capacity to go and go through all the footage and edit this into clips and put them up? It's hard. The... Yeah, it's hard work. It's like when people say, oh, can you just make a, can you make a two-minute trailer to go with this? And I'm like, man, that trust trailer took me three months. I'm not kidding you, you know. And uh, you know, so it's 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 hard work for someone, but it will be gratifying because you've got a you know you got a chance of hitting some serious views and actually the film is broken up into discrete sections i can share the script with you so you can get an idea of how it chunks together and pick a piece and work on it could work and i'd be happy to help that'd be that fun be really yeah imagine yeah. also since all the the interviews are up there as well it would be really cool to, to kind of just see the bitcoin community take that raw material and and, and make even more content out of it and uh you know, Ex different exactly and that you can get those interviews direct but also we're going to put the torrents for the for the raw footage so some of it was hired they're all 720p but you can get the hd content and all you have to do is commit to making your rushes available you don't have to make them searchable, but I'll give you the code for that if you want to do it, but just make them available. So it's a sort of Creative Commons license. I made it up myself. <laughs> That's yeah, the condition. Yeah. And, the Jamie um, Commons license. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, based on my, based on my uh, annoyance about how many filmmakers just leave their rushes to rot and when we could be making great films out of them. So yeah, go and make a different film. Go make a better film, you know? Uh, the software these days, you know, Black Magic, you can... Uh, da Vinci, you can use that for free. Uh, so you could, you know, you don't need Premiere. You can, you know, that's free. And so you could make a great film yourself using the rushes and add your own stuff to it. You know, people did that with Steel Lives Film. I thought it was hilarious. One guy <laughs> cut himself in, he cut himself into the film wearing like sunglasses, <laughs> interviewing himself. I was like, <laughs> Uh, this is brilliant. Uh, that's, that, that's when you know when you know when you know you've made it. You know, so get go for it. Have have fun. I have a challenge to anyone. I'll who's do the watching. music if you want some music. A challenge to anyone who's watching: cut Elon Musk into this film in a way that makes him uh, supportive of Bitcoin's uh, energy oh, usage. I love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah, should do that. I should do that. I deliberately, uh, yeah, I deliberately left Elon out. I deliberately didn't. I mean, there's one mention like Bitcoin doesn't seek subsidies or vir virtue or yeah. subsidies, which is a sort of sidelong Elon. Oh, no. But I thought I'm not going to mention him because, you know, he he's he's just a troll. I'm, I, he's, I, uh, he's not an just a, he's not just a troll. He's not just a troll, but he is a troll as well as amongst other an things. expert troll. <laughs> I think it's one of yeah. his like hobbies since he was a child. He's just one of those people. Um, he's gotten pretty good at it. He has, he yeah. Gotta, gotta <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. One thing I wanted to mention real quick was Richard James's film uh, Petrodollar, which was based on a piece by Alex Gladstein, and I always like Richie's work. Uh, but it's a good, in? good um, kind of, I guess, one of the you know companion. Yeah, that, to this piece. that's there smart well. filmmaking. By the by the way, that's yeah. smart filmmaking. That's how you'd clever filmmaking. You take a take someone's. To the, you know, speech they've already done, an essay they've already done, and yep. just you know, build it around that. That's not going to yeah. take you three three months, and it's a really exactly. accessible, 
if anybody's yeah. thinking about making films, I suggest you take that route. <laughs> <laughs> take a take a Guy Swan episode and find yeah. some really fun footage and yeah. just you know, there you go, and some music. Absolutely. He's really good at it. <laughs> well, all right, gents. Uh, I think that might be it for today. Any any closing words for the folks at home for budding filmmakers and Bitcoiners and where can they where can they find everything? I think we put all the links in the description, but uh... yeah, thismachinegreens.com for the that's where all the footage is at, and you can get the film there. Uh, go and check out the trust trailer and see if you feel like getting involved with with helping us make that. Um, and yeah, if, if anybody wants to get involved in doing the bite sized chunks, the remix stuff, hit me up. Um, we, we'd definitely be happy to help out with that. I think and that's uh, it. you know. It's worth noting too that that like we did talk about this a little bit already, but the the film was crowdfunded by like 117 Bitcoiners that donated to make this happen, and 70% of them used the Lightning Network, which used zero energy and zero fees. So <laughs> it's it was awesome to see that the Lightning Network was uh, was was highly represented in the people that chose to send Sats through TallyCoin. So like shout out to DJ Booth for creating that. Tallycoin uh, website. I, I'm I'm trying to convince him to like work on it more and like make it more yeah. like a mainstream thing, you know, because yeah. it's such an awesome idea. Yeah, some yeah. perks would be good. Perks would be good, but it is absolutely fantastic because it goes straight into your wallet. In this case, I've got a Casa multi sig I set up for this for trust, and it just goes straight in there. So he's not handling the donations at all, which is which is really really cool. It just needs perks. Uh, um, would be one thing because um, it's it was very hard to message people about their about getting their credits. So I wound up like a hundred people donated, and like twelve people have got their credit in the film because the, the, I couldn't reach everybody. I'm assuming that they wanted it. Some of them, more of them, would wanted it, but wanted it, but I couldn't reach them. So yeah, I agree with you. It's fantastic, and uh, I saw he's doing a crowd fund now actually to to fund the next uh, stage of development. Okay, yeah, I'll have to reach out I, to him. I didn't know that. Yeah, this is this is your moment, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I gladly spend some sats on this type of stuff. Otherwise, I'm just gonna get sucked into like degen stuff, like NFTs and shit coins. And I'd rather support Bitcoin than than all that nonsense. So, if you got yeah. good projects, send them my way. Yeah. <laughs> translations, uh, translations, and stuff. Hey, Brad. <laughs> Go towards the light, Brad. Go towards Brad. the light. <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. I think that's a movie idea. It's called Save no, Brad no, no, no. Shitcoins. Huh? <laughs> a Canadian family man okay. in the woods. It's lost. <laughs> Haunted by NFTs that he could have bought. Well, all right so then, that, that, everybody. That's all I got. Yeah, that's it. Thank you uh, so much for hosting us. Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking around and listening to the banter. And what a privilege. Thank you. Privilege was ours. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> you gentlemen. Great work. Stay well. <laughs>